call our scholars class. And even though there's only one scholar actually here, Amen. we're trying to be that, trying to dig a little deeper in understanding our history, why we believe what we believe, why the Bible is, lots of things that, you know, we believe by faith, but we'd like to know as well, because some things we don't have to do by faith, we can actually know. Uh, so walking in faith is a great thing, and we want to do that, but there's a great amount of knowledge that helps us, and when people ask us questions, we can go, ooh, I know that now, and we can defend our faith with a, with a stronger foundation. So what do you say we open in prayer? Amen. Father, we always come to you every Sunday. And I come in thanks and praise always. And we thank you for this class. Lord, we ask that growth be given here both spiritually and in number as people get used to us being here once a month trying to dig deeper into the word of God. We ask wisdom be given to our brother. Let the words of his heart and meditations be given to each and every individual here. I lay my hands upon him, asking that he pours forth from the Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we do one thing before we start? Can everybody go around? Because we've got visitors and people that are new to us just recently, mm -hmm. so that everybody knows everybody's name. Because this is, you'll know, be teaching, but there will be questions, and this will be uh, more of a discussion, not like a sermon. <laughs> And uh, so we at least want to be able to go besides, hey, you. So I'm, as you, I'm Pastor Lane LaPage, uh, senior pastor here. I am Pastor Associate Pastor Richard Ward. Rick will work fine. Pastor Ricky, Ed, fine. Welcome, Ed. Shaquille. I'm John. I am Rick Ward's son. And I'm Bobby, also Richard Ward's son. Glennis. Not his son. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. You don't say. <laughs> you sure? I'm Patty. No relation. And I'm Sally. No relation. And then one, one quick announcement. Um, I am not being bored by him or walking out on him, but I have to be at a service at Wyoming in the Lodge at 6 p.m., and I am now speaking at that little service. So I do have to leave a little early. Uh, not because I don't want to hear his teaching, but I still have to get cross town in Detroit, and we know about traffic in this day and age. So I will be parting out a little early, but I wanted to explain why uh, I would rather be staying. But uh, I have to go impart a little knowledge and to, to another group of uh, pastors down on, in down, downtown Detroit. Pastor? Mm -hmm. All right, I do have the one advantage you all do not have, though, I, he teaches me personally. So, well, <laughs> I do get to, whatever he does, basically, and I've had, the, I've had this earlier than you guys did, so I was able to go through it already. Yes, so. actually, I wanted, I gave him the same packet that sits in front of you, and asked him to go through it, tweak it any way he wanted to, and he said it was fine the way it was written. I said it was not fine, I said so, it was perfect the way it was written. Alright, you have a packet in front of you. And it is broken down on page one, the tools of the trade. We'll read that. Page two is the rules of the road. Those will be the standards and guidelines by which this class is governed. Page three is the topics of study list. And these are not individual topics that we will study once a month for the next two years kind of a thing. They are actually clustered into groups that will address common things that, like the first four, are going to be taken care of next month. By the end of the class next month, you will be able to know what, what is the Bible anyway, why the Bible and no other holy book, why is the Bible structured topically and not in a historical timeline, and the different translations of the Bible, why there are so many. That will be all answered in the next class. Some of it will be addressed in this one. You'll note at the bottom of this, there are two blank lines. You are more than welcome to fill those in with topics that you would like discussed. And no, we will not wait until we get through the first 24 before we get to the bottom two, if the bottom two beats the class interests and in what we're doing. The fourth page is the actual name of this class. And it is an acrostic for absorb, assimilating biblical scholarship on a reasonable basis. And it is assimilating, which means you, it's on the back. It should be in there. 
Absorb. It may be on the page before that. I'm sorry. In mine, I've got it. I just did this one. Thing. Yeah, absorb. If you could find that. And assimilating means that the purpose of this class is not to puff your head up with knowledge. The purpose of this class is to actually increase your ability to not only understand, but to live the way the Bible says to live. Because if you don't, you just simply set yourself up for being in disobedience before God and an attack target of darkness. God doesn't reward disobedience. Satan will attack you if you're vulnerable. That's just the reality of it. So you need to absorb this, assimilate it. It will be biblical scholarship. It's not just going to be Bible stories and some Sunday school stuff. There will be scholarship involved, and that's why I've got this up here. And it will be on a reasonable basis. There will be reasons for everything. I will never expect you to blindly believe something. There will be a reason for it. It will either be biblical or historical or both. There will be a tradition to it. There will be a reality that is necessary to be a complete Christian. And then the last two pages, what is the Bible anyways, is the curriculum for next month. This will discuss, this will answer pretty much everything in the first four of the topics of study. There will be a actual teaching of this. This is an outline. And those of you that know outlines know that outlines are not complete. This is not, because you know, you can read this whole thing in like 10 minutes if you take your time. But this is going to occupy hours. The only requirement that I have of you in this class is that when there is a reference in your notes that you actually, between the end of this class and the beginning of the next one, you write it out. Because when you see it with your eyes, write it out with your hand, and ideally speak it out your mouth and hear it with your ears, you are immersing yourself and feeding yourself spiritually. And that is the way that we grow. Growing is not by sitting in a pew absorbing and doing nothing. All of you, except for my two sons, are parents. You know that what babies come as. They come with basically four main functions. They cry, they make messes, they grasp, and they suckle. How many have ever seen a baby sleeping do that? And that's what a new believer does too. You will grasp things, you'll understand. You want to get a hold of truths that can benefit you. You'll want to feed on the Bible, the Word of God. You'll be hungry for it. And you'll probably make messes. And you'll probably cry. But the truth of God's Word was designed for us in order to connect with Him as a child to parent. Ultimately, it can't be simplified more than that. It is a relationship-based faith. It's not really an obedience-based faith. Obedience is a big part of it, but it's relationship-based. Just like obedience is a big part in any family. Kids that decide at 10 that they know more than their parents do and say, no, I'm not going to do that, probably will have problems. And Christians that say the same thing, no, I'm not going to do that, will probably have problems. But it's a relationship-based thing. It's not God being mean. It's just that's how relationships work. That's how a family works. That's how a marriage works. Amen. All right, let's go through this. The Cathedral of Valor Scholars Class. There are six topics here on the first page. All of you going forward need to have a Bible. If you don't have one now, See if you can secure one and bring one. Um, a Bible. Pastor, let the Bible. <laughs> All right. A good study Bible is preferred. And a study Bible is one that has all kinds of notes in the bottom. Eddie, hold it yourself. This is a study Bible. And turn it around so they can see it. Okay. Open up the pages. Okay. Thank you. Right. And in it you'll see the text. And below.
below it, you'll see the commentary notes that go with it. That's a study Bible where they actually will take it apart, verse by verse, sometimes word by word, and actually explain what's going on. We are separated from the writers of this book by at least 1,900 years. How many here think that you could take a piece of paper and pencil and write down what the world would be like 1,900 years from now? And be accurate? Yeah. Well, they were. But they wrote it in their time. We don't live in that time. Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of reconstruct what they were trying to get across. And that's what a good study Bible does. I've got some suggestions here. You can go through them if you wish. I want to read one section. This is from the King James Translators. I finally found a Bible that has the introduction from the translators. You don't normally get this in the King James. I want to read this. It's written in Elizabethan English, so you'll excuse it, please. <clears throat> now, to the imputations of our adversaries, doesn't that sound nice? We do not deny, no, we affirm and avow that the very meanest translation of the Bible in English set forth by men of our profession, for we have seen none of theirs in the whole Bible as yet, contains the word of God. No, it is the word of God. Just as the king's speech, which he uttered in Parliament, being translated into French, Dutch, Italian, and Latin, is still the king's speech, though it be not interpreted by every translator with the same grace, nor for adventure so fitly for phrase, nor so expressly for sense everywhere. It is confessed that things are to take their denomination of the greater part, and the natural man could literally say, something in Latin that I'm not going to translate now because it's kind of big, but basically don't put your ego on the line that you're not willing to be corrected. The King James translators translated in, anybody want to call out the year? 1611. 1611. There have been five separate revisions of this. A typical King James now is an 1899 translation by a guy uh, named Scribner. So, if the King James translators said what they did, that the different translations out there is the Word of God, even though it doesn't match perfectly, a previous translation is true. And the reason for that, a very important reason for that, I'd like you to, if you have your Bibles, if you would please, open to John chapter 6. And I'll, only, I'll use the King James. Actually, I think we'll use the yeah, King James. John chapter 6. And I want to read from, I'll find it here. All right, verse 63. I will start at verse 61. We'll start at verse 60. Many disciples fall away. All right? King James, follow it with me if you can. John chapter 6, verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they have heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, Does this offend you? What? If you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickens or makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. And we'll just stop there. These words have power within them. But that power is not energized just by reading them. That power is energized by the Holy Spirit. And that power is only energized when the Holy Spirit is at work in an individual life. Those of you that have been Christians for a while and have you know, maybe shared the gospel with somebody and they looked at you like, yeah, right. 
That's simply an indication not that you failed, it's that the Holy Spirit wasn't working at that time in that individual's life. It's the Spirit that makes alive this book, just the words in this book, by Jesus' own statement and by what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Coming here and listening to me, you will get words, and you will get from the Holy Spirit that is in you. But that is something that you have to consciously ask for, seek for, receive. Just listening to words is not going to make you grow. It's the Holy Spirit that gives life. And that's why translations, people get all bent out of shape sometimes about translations, but translations are words. The words profit nothing without the Spirit. So don't be afraid of different translations. There is no perfect translation out there. Can I make a comment to that, Pastor? Cool. One of the things with translations, and we have a lot of people that are, especially in the evangelical world, who think King James is the only translation that we can talk about. The realization is we live in the year 2018, and you've heard me preach. I'm not looking to mold myself after the conformity of this world, but I don't speak Shakespearean, Elizabethan English. Do any of you? And the reality is, sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, yeah. Verily, yay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the, the deal is that it is great for poetry, for psalms and proverbs, mm -hmm. and it has a wonderful fit to it, um, even in the, the writer set in a nicer way. But when we're learning, I mean, how many enjoyed Shakespeare in high school? Yeah. You're, you're, it's all, but there's always about 10%, but the rest of the 90%, yeah. we took the class because they required it and we needed the credit to get through school. The reality is that it, we learn easier in the language that we speak. And the reason they've upgraded them through the years is because there's been about five morphs of the English language. I mean, even between the British English, Australian English, Scottish English, and American English, we are separated by a common language. It may be the same, but boy, it is not. And therefore, what the writers have done through the years is tried, without taking away from the beauty of King James, to put it in a language that we can understand that is our common speaking language yeah. of this day. It, it's either, it, you know, the word of God is inspired. And if we receive from it, it doesn't matter whether it's King James, English, New American Standard, Living Bible, whatever it is, if we receive for it, that's the inspiration because it's by the Spirit. Go ahead. Yeah. I have some uh, options here that if you're going to get a study Bible, one of them should be King James, another should be an NIV, and then if you get a third, there's a bunch there that are good. I have all of them. You need a concordance. Now that can either be an online concordance, and there's lots of them out there. You can type in on your computer or phone, PC Study Bible, and you can get a list of at least 25 free sites that can help you. Yeah, all of this can be gotten free online. If it you can. want to involve, invest into a nice leather bound, it's a great investment, but all this can be gotten for it free, so there'll be no expenditure. So a concordance, a Bible dictionary, I've given some good ones. There are some questionable Bible dictionaries out there as well. A Bible handbook, and I like the thing about a Bible handbook because it gives a condensed explanation of every book in the Bible, plus lots of helpful information about the context, original language, cross-references, and background of the scriptures. I list some both. If you want to go deeper, there are things called lexicons, which is an old Greek word for dictionary. And they take every single Greek word and not just give you a one-phrase definition, they actually give you like several paragraphs of definition. And it's good. And then there are commentaries. And there are a lot of commentaries out there that are very good, but they're also very expensive. You can get like 70 volume commentaries where there's a commentary for each book and sometimes two for a book in a very dense type of book like Hebrews. All right, next page, Rules of the Road. A Bible scholar is one who studies the Bible for spiritual growth and personal enrichment. Those are the two things we're going for here. We're not going here, becoming a Bible scholar means that you can walk around in pride knowing more than everybody else. This is for your own spiritual growth and your own personal enrichment. You can't study for somebody else. They have to study for themselves. 
You can't obey for anybody else. You can't sin for anybody else. There are certain things you have to do for you. And this is one of them. It's your personal enrichment. It's your personal discipleship. It's the, the Bible has been characterized as being simple enough for a child to understand. How many here remember Sunday school stories? You go back that far? David and, the, David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's den, the three Hebrew children, those stories. Yet deep enough to exhaust the efforts of the wisest students to plummet's depths. This class will strike a middle ground between the two. It will remain plain and straightforward. We won't go off on tangents. We won't go off on critical skepticism. History records that this has happened repeatedly when the people study the Bible for themselves, and that's literally what happens when you stick with the words and don't receive from the Holy Spirit. The reality is that in church history, unborn again people got into high church offices. And because of that, twisted this book into such a way that it was not recognizable by the time of the Reformation. That's one of the reasons why the Reformation took place. Bishop? Yeah, I want to make note of that. Even one of the popes during the time when the Roman Church was the only Christian church on earth became a pope because his family bought his way in. And he, and he couldn't read. And yet he was, quote, the spiritual leader of the, of the quote, world, strictly because of finances. Mm -hmm. So even though he's a leader, he was no more Christian than the guy that's sitting on that Monday morning drunk over here. Uh, could have been. I mean, you know, who knows if he actually eventually received the Lord. But that's why it's so important to that. Lots of people, even on the television and the radio, who declare themselves to be Christians, know the words, but nothing here. So, go ahead, Mister. Sure. We have a Bible that has 66 books in it. It's not the only type of organization. If you come from a Roman Catholic background, you'll know that there are more books in the Roman Catholic Bible than the typical Protestant Bible. You have what's called the Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. And there's controversy about that. If you grew up in Egypt and were a Coptic Christian, you have 78 books in your Bible. And depending on which branch of Coptic, the Ethiopians carry 96 books in their Bible. We will stick to the Protestant one of 66 books to avoid the controversy of which ones are scripture and which ones are not. These 66 books occur in all of their Bibles. We're not going to go into the add-ons. Just and he'll no. explain next week why those 66 are the ones next that we, month. we uh, next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's gonna All right, I'm just going to highlight a few of these. If you will look at that, the Word of God is inerrant, infallible, and sufficient. One, inerrant means that it doesn't err. And in meaning it doesn't err, it's using an example of an archer. The Bible will always hit a bullseye on its target. The Bible has differences in it. There are over 24,000 manuscripts of just the Greek or just the New Testament alone in seven different languages. And no, they do not all agree. That's why you have Bible societies, and that's why you have scholars that will go through all the different manuscripts. Because not everybody that made a manuscript paid a lot of close attention. Some that did make manuscripts shifted some words back and forth to fit their own particular doctrinal bent. But God has given us a promise. And I want you to turn with me, please, in Psalms chapter 12. We have God's word on this. Start at verse 6. Psalms 12, 6, and 7. The words of this is the New American or New, New International. The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver, purified in a crucible, like gold in a furnace, refined seven times. You, Lord, will keep them and will protect them forever from the wicked, who freely strut about when what is vile is honored by the human race. What will God keep? These words. God has promised to keep his word pure. Not every translation is pure, but there is out there somewhere a Greek manuscript and a Hebrew manuscript that is exactly the same as what God originally gave the original author. We just have no way to find it. 
but it's our bishop. Let me give an example of what he's talking about. Martin Luther, founder of what we know as modern Protestantism. Um, story. <clears throat> hmm? Go. Yeah. Martin himself hated the book of James, and he hated the book of Job. He, he wanted to make them an addendum to the Bible. Though they had been accepted by the scholars, they didn't fit his doctrinal understanding of the scripture, and if he'd have had any say in it, they wouldn't be part of the Bible. Even though he admitted that they were, he didn't like them, and, and, and really tried to make them go away, because he didn't like what they had to say. So I'm glad he didn't, but here is the modern founder of the separation between Catholicism and Protestantism, and even he had his own bent on what should be and shouldn't be. And that's true. All right, we're not going to study heresies in particular. We'll refer to them if necessary as to why they are wrong, but we're not going to ask. This is not a class on apologetics. Next one, we're not going to study conspiracy theories. We're not going to get off um, secret societies, uh, that kind of a thing, even though it's dealt with in Scripture to a certain extent. We're not going to actually study them, we'll refer to them, but we're not going to study them. We're going to avoid rabbit trails if we can. And I give a couple of examples, like trying to determine the return date of the Lord Jesus Christ or the actual personal identity of the last Antichrist. We're not going to go there, okay? The Bible says we'll never know the date. There are people that have tried. We, I could sit here and tell you two good stories. I don't want to take the time of people that sold everything that they had and went up to a mountain somewhere dressed in white and waited for it in the 1880s. Didn't happen. There was another book that was popular for a while, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Was Coming Back in 1988. And when he didn't come back in 88, the same author did 89 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Was Coming Back in 1989. <laughs> We're not going to go to those kind of books. We're not going to study that. Uh, we will be Protestant rather than Roman Catholic, and it will not be structured around a single denomination. It will actually be structured around the word. I give a couple of examples in here of the Westminster Larger and Shorter Catechism of the Westminster Confession, and you can get all kinds of stuff out there as to what's the exact right doctrine, the exact right theology, and none of them are perfect. I've read almost all of them. Almost all of them have flaws. Our Nicene Creed has flaws in it. Every creed, every doctrine, every theology has got some flaw in it because they wanted to emphasize something against heresy instead of letting it stick strictly to the Word of God. The one example where it says in the Nicene Creed that we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. Baptism does not remit your sins. The Apostle Paul is very specific and spends a lot of New Testament ink as to what remits your sins, and it's not water baptism. We preached about this it's just three the, weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> It is the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that remits your sins. It's not water. Water simply recognizes that. But in that time, they had problems with people that would pray the prayer and then just not do anything with their lives. It was dangerous to be a Christian in the first 300 years. So they would want to be sure that they were right with God, but that that would be it. So the church built catechisms that emphasized these things. But then they did that beyond what the Word of God said. We're not going to go there. I have a question. Yeah. You said it was dangerous back then. Why? You said what? You said it was dangerous back then to be a Christian. Persecution. From who? Well, Christians. I'll just give one example. Under Nero, which is the emperor that was in power when the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter were martyred. The Apostle Paul was beheaded on the Appian Way. The Apostle Peter was crucified upside down, outside the city of Rome. They wouldn't even crucify him in Rome. They crucified him on the property of the Vatican family. There was actually a family in Rome named Vaticans. And over time, Vatican Hill became the Vatican that we think of today. Peter's grave was actually in Vatican Hill. You can go back and look that up. Now, whether the particular set of bones they've got in the grotto underneath the Pope's throne is actually Peter, we'll never know. But that's just part of it. I mean, the Apostle Paul was beheaded, Peter was crucified upside down, Nero, for one group of Christians, tied him up tight, poured hot tar on him, let the tar 
partner. Stick him on a pole and set him on fire for one of his parties. Yes? You can read Fox and stuff with martyrs in it. Yes. Would you like to live in that time? See, this is why I'm here. Because <laughs> these are little things, little nuggets that I have no idea. Okay, yes. Nero hated us. Oh, he yeah. It's it's not necessary to go into all the different tortures that they would that they came up with. They had this one, I'll just throw in one more, they had this one for children. If they found a group of Christians catechizing kids, they would take the kids, they would pamper them, feed them well, fatten them up, wrap them in sheepskins, and then lead them out to a bunch of starving wild dogs. It was dangerous to be a Christian back then. And there were a lot of people that still wanted to go to heaven, but didn't want to do it at the expense of their lives. And so through history, the church has had to adjust itself to those realities. What we will do is try not to adjust ourselves to those realities when we are not facing that. We will adjust ourselves to that book. That's the nature of this class. Last one. I got one. Yes, sir. Bye. Love you guys. Hey, at 5.30, tell him he's done, because he'll teach till 9. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't. My wife wouldn't let me get away with that. Blessings, everyone. All right, Bishop, thank you. If you look here, where it says, We hold to the truth that we need to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. There are two scriptures there. Your responsibility in this class is to actually hand copy out scriptures. I will give references. It's your responsibility to actually write them out. Those are the first two references you'll get. Joshua 1, 8, and 9, and 1 Timothy 4, 13 through 16. Circle them, underline them, highlight them, whatever you need to do. We will follow this proverb, and this goes all this goes back several hundred years. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Or love. There are some things that really are not essential. They are there for our edification, exhortation, and comfort. But what comforts me may not comfort Chuck or Eddie. But God had to include everything in there that would be available for his family. So not everything is essential. There's nothing wrong if a scripture really zings home to Eddie and doesn't to anybody else. You know? You each have your own lives and discipleship to live. And this is the apparatus that we will be using to understand the scripture, the very bottom one. Apparatus is an actual seminary term, which means basically a box where you stick a scripture verse in one or the other. Okay? And this box has five parts. Context. A scripture will be understood in its context, the immediate context, sentence, and paragraph the book, and then the historical context. Some, the Bible was written on three different continents, if you didn't know that. Moses wrote in Egypt. We know he did. He traveled around Sinai for 38 years, and he wrote the first five books of probably the book of Job while he was doing that. That's Egypt. Paul wrote in Europe, particularly in Greece and Rome. Rome is still in Europe today, and so is Greece. Daniel wrote in what was then Babylon, what we would now call Iraq, on the Euphrates River. Three different continents. And we need to understand that because they were not all dictated by one author, you know, like take for example the Quran. The Quran was written by Muhammad. One guy, one culture, one time, one book. The Bible is not that. The original language, the original languages of the Bible are Hebrew and Greek, with a little bit of Aramaic or Syrian. Aramaic and Syrian are basically the same. They're like Bishop said it's Australian English versus American English. I mean, it's English, but there are differences of words and what they use and how they were defined. And multiple cross-references. The reality is God never said everything he wanted to say in one spot. You can go to any single scripture where God talks about love, and he can say a lot there, but it's not everything he wanted to say about that. It's been stated that the story of Jesus Christ runs all the way from Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation chapter 22. 1,056 chapters. God never said everything about Jesus Christ in any one of them. 
you need the whole thing. So it'll be multiple cross-references. The background, the, basically the historical background, we're going to try to reconstruct what the first audience heard. Again, English has changed from 1611. I've got a copy of the 1611 King James. None of you would like it. It's rough. Well, all right, my son Bobby would like it. He <laughs> uses it, but nobody else really would. And then you synthesize. You take all of that and put it together. And that's how you comb the scriptures. If you've got a map in your hair, you comb it out. If you've got something in the Bible you don't understand, that's how you comb it. Context, original language, cross-references, background. Bring it together, and you get the idea of what God's trying to get across. And that's what we're going to do. The topics of study list, we've gone over that. The two lines on the bottom, we'll do absorb in just a second, uh, are for you if there's a subject that you want. And now we go to absorb. <laughs> Yeah. It's just been stapled in the wrong order. I, I did. I yeah. we'll Actually, that. this is no offense to Office Depot, but their printer did that. I had the papers uh -huh. set what I thought was right, and when they came out, that's how they came out. Huh. No. Anyways, absorb. Assimilating biblical scholarship on a reasonable basis, and you want to assimilate it. And you want to engage your mind as well as your heart. Your mind will understand, but your heart is what believes. Romans 10.10 10 says, With the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Your head, your brain, cannot believe as far as the Bible is concerned. You can understand. You can agree. You can know it well enough to teach it. But if it doesn't get here, if it doesn't change you, then it's powerless to you. It has no value. It's the spirit that gives one, not just the letters, the words. Yes? Um, we had a saying in our youth group, it's missing heaven by 12 inches. Yes. About the distance between your your mind uh -huh. and your heart. Well, isn't this where the enemy fights us or gets... It can <coughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, we feed our spirits the same way we feed our bodies. The ancients figured out that there was an inner man and an outer man, and these two paralleled each other. Jesus said in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the only thing in the entire New Testament where he said it seven times in a row. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, everybody had these little flaps of flesh on the side of their heads. Those were not the ears he was speaking of. These ears, the inner ears. You have an inner ear, inner ears, you have an inner voice, you have an inner man. That's where the action takes place as far as the Holy Spirit working in your life. And this, you get the word of God into your spirit the same way you get it in, the same way you get food into your body. You chew it. One of the scriptures that you will copy out is Joshua 1, 8 and 9. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein. And the word meditate is an old word, and in Hebrew it's agah, and literally means you'll chew on it. You'll mutter it to yourself over and over under your breath. Just like you would chew a nice piece of meat or a nice piece of any kind of food, you chew on it. You say it over and over. Chew you could. And eventually, your spirit man will swallow that. And it will give it nourishment. That's what we're after. You shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. You'll make your way prosperous. You'll have good success if you put the Word of God in your mouth and let it get into your heart. And that's, again, what we're after. On Absorb, I have eight scriptures here. The first three I did not write out in completion so I could fit it all on one page. The last five are written out for you. I still would ask you to write them out. You just don't have to look them up now. The first three... Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, which we'll go over here. That'll be the last thing that we do. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, that tells us that knowledge puffs up a man, but agape, charity, edifies. 2 Corinthians 2, 17 through chapter 3, verse 6. Long section, but all of it is meaty and good for you. I pick on verse chapter 3, verse 6. It's not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit kills. And that's what we're after. The rest of these you can read in the 
kernel of what I think you need to get out of it is listed here for you. Uh, so we'll finish up here again with Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the one word in there that's mentioned twice, somebody call it out to me. Hearing. Hearing. Very good. You are designed by God to believe you before you believe anybody else. You just are. If you believe, if you hear yourself say things over and over, you will convince yourself of them, and it will, I mean, people will waste their breath trying to change your mind. That's just the way God made us. So say these things over and over to yourself. Meditate. Hagah. Repeat them. Chew on them. And I'll give you illustrations of how you can chew on them. All right. Lastly, we have, what is the Bible anyway? And this is what we will be jumping in for February. I give you five separate chunks of information as to what the Bible really is. And a little bit on what it isn't, but mostly what it is. And I did that at Bishop's request because he said, and I've shared this with those that were in the class earlier, that there are ministers out here that are pastoring churches that have no Bible college in them at all. They know enough that they are born again, they have a call of God in their lives. They can take a scripture and they can preach it. They can take a paragraph. They can illustrate it, give examples. But to actually understand the whole is missing. Why are there 66 books? Why are they organized the way they are? Why aren't more in there? Why aren't fewer in there? What were the tests that were given before they were included? What do they say? A lot of people, even in church leadership, don't know. That's what this class is designed for. By the end of the studies that we will do here, probably by the holidays, Christmas holidays coming up, we will have gone through everything in that packet so that you'll be able to answer all 24 of those questions listed in that packet in front of you, and if you've got a couple of the underlines underneath it, we'll answer those two. Questions? All right. We're going now, and for this, I've got the thing up here. If you have a Bible, turn to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Fifth book in the New Testament. And whoever finds it first in their translation, just go ahead and read it out. Okay. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties to be a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed by the entire renewal of your mind, that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good, acceptable, and perfect in his sight. Amen. And that is the Amplified Very Version. <laughs> that, that, you see, see in your packet, Very that will be our foundation scripture. This verse is what this class will live out. And we're going to take it apart. There are 17 separate phrases in those two verses. I've got them listed up here. And we're going to unpack them. All of us here that have traveled, you pack a suitcase. And when you get to your destination, you unpack it. Unless you don't have a dresser there, and then just leave it in the suitcase, but it becomes a mess. I mean, but you, you know, you unpack things that you need. One of the people that attends church here has a jewelry business, and when she goes to do a jewelry show, she takes her stuff. When she gets there, she unpacks it. She displays it. I'm going to unpack and display these two verses. It's there, but needs to be unpacked and understood. All right, I beseech you. First of all, this is the Apostle Paul. 
And as Michelle read, she said, I beg of you. That's what the word beseech means. He did not mean when he stood there, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ that you are to do this. He didn't do that. Why? Well, because they were brothers. How many here do you think would do it if my son Christopher said this to John? I command you to go pick up my clothes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, do you want me to laugh again? <laughs> <laughs> you don't command in a relationship like that. You beseech. You ask nicely. Particularly married couples. There's no way I would walk up to my wife and say something like, I command you to empty that wastebasket now! <laughs> and that's, you know, you just don't do that. At least not if you want to be happy. So he said, I beseech you, I'm asking you this. Please, this is for your own good. Do this. It works. I beseech you, please. So if you're taking notes, you can put that. Please, with an exclamation mark. I beseech you can be summarized by please do this. I'm an apostle. Now, I'm, I'm speaking for Paul. I'm an apostle. I can command you Romans to do this. You Romans are used to command. You command the whole world right now. But that's not how the kingdom of God works. It's based on relationship. I listened to my wife and I both, to Rabbi Zacharias, a great apologist, and he had this one statement where he read from a first century Roman centurion and he said there are two things that are to be sought in life love and power and no man has both because if you exercise strict dictatorial power you're not going to be loved you're just not and if you try to exercise just soft love people are just going to walk away if there's no consequences to disobedience, you know, they will walk away. If there was no consequences to theft, people would steal. There are consequences to these things. So Paul is saying here, please, he's talking here, brethren. Brethren is a Greek word which means from the same womb. That's really what a brother or sister is. He came from the same womb. It's the Greek word Adolphus. Adolphus is a woman's womb in Greek. Adolphus means you came from them. We share the same birth, basically. The same birth experience. What Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We have the same birth process. And if somebody doesn't have the same birth process, all of this is wasted. Paul also said that the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. He can't understand them because they're spiritual and they're spiritually discerned. It goes back to what we talked about. It's the Spirit that quickens, the Spirit that gives life. The letter kills. You have the same birth. And it's by the mercies of God. We are not born. The word mercy there. Elpis in Greek, and literally means the same experience that any of us would have if we saw, and I saw this on the TV not too long ago, some, this guy driving by the road, saw somebody pull over to the side, take a bag of squirming something or other out, dump it on the side of the road when it was like five degrees outside, and go off. Mercy. Curiosity first, but mercy got a hold of this guy. He pulled over after him, opened it up, and there were six rambunctious puppies in there. Now, logic would say, just cold, inhuman logic would say, I don't need six puppies. They're nothing but work. They're going to be messy. They've got to be fed. They're going to grow up. What am I going to do with them? Didn't think any of that. What do you think he did? Picked up the bag of puppies, put it, yeah, put it in his car, and drove up. I mean, basically there's a scripture in Ezekiel that says that that's what God did with us. He saw us as his enemies. He saw us as their sin. And by compassion, mercy, he pulled over and picked us up. 
And he's using that same term. Look, I saw you like this. I picked you up and I cared for you. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Can't you just, by the mercies that I showed to you, do what I'm asking of you? Anybody with a functioning conscience, an understanding of this, would say, yes, I'll do that. I'll obey you. You didn't have to come get me, but you did. And that does mean something to me. And this is what he asks of us. We present our bodies. I want to write in here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And for this reason, the Father doesn't need your body. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy, he is eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, dwelling in a light, man cannot approach unto him. He doesn't need your body. He doesn't want your body. Jesus doesn't want your body. He's got them. It was given to him first by his mother Mary, and second by his father at the resurrection. That leaves who that wants your body? The, Spirit. the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have a body. He needs yours. And the reasonable service we'll get into that because of what God did for us when he pulled over and picked us up, he wants to flow in you, change you, and use you to help others. And there are some times where we just don't know how to do that. There are some problems that are just too complex and too well cemented that we can't deal with it. People that have mental illness, people that have addictions, people that have marital problems, financial problems, that have already made themselves, buried themselves in a pit they can't crawl out of. We don't have power to change that. Humankind doesn't have that. Government doesn't really have that. Anybody want to tell me what the, what's called a recidivism rate on prisoners is? Prisoners that come out of prison after their sentences and go back? John? Uh, 60 or 70%, something like that. Seven, well, it depends on the prison. Depends the program, on the prison, but, but yes, yeah, somewhere in the About three quarters of everybody that goes into prison, comes out of prison, ends up back there. They're not changed on the inside. <coughs> and if you present your body to the Holy Spirit, He will change that inside. Things that bother you now won't bother you if you do what the Holy Spirit says. Things you're angry at, things you're worried about, things you're anxious over. He'll change you and then through you, change them. That's what he wants. A living, two words here, sacrifice, which is an oxymoron. <clears throat> living obviously means alive. Sacrifice to die for. was death. We don't live in a sacrificial religious system here in the Western world. For the most part, none of us here raise lambs so that we can slit their throats on Passover and eat their flesh. We don't have to come to this church with our animals under, you know, birds for sacrifices, like it says in the book of Leviticus, a bull or a cow or a goat or a sheep. We don't do those kind of sacrifices, but the original audience that heard this did. If you went to a pagan temple, you brought your best of whatever, you gave it to the priest, the priest would then perform the ritual. Normally they would extract when they, when they gutted the thing, they'd save the liver, because if you looked at the liver and discerned it, you're supposed to be able to discern the will of the gods. And then they would either throw the thing onto a fire pit for a whole burnt sacrifice, but mostly what they did was they fed it to some more priests in the back who skinned it and then sold it for the best price. So you had the best meat at the cheapest price coming from the pagan temples. That's just what they did. They understood sacrifice, and when they heard sacrifice, that's what they thought of. When we hear sacrifice, most of the time we think of sacrifice money. Dig deep and sacrifice for this cause. Or we think of giving labor. Sacrifice of your time and your talent and do this. That's not what they're thinking of sacrifice. They're thinking of something dying in their place. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here, look, I know what you're thinking with sacrifice, but Jesus has already done that. He sacrificed for you. And you can't improve on that. So what do you do? 
You present your bodies alive, but dead to yourself. All of us here are smart enough to realize that if we indulged ourselves and gave ourselves everything we wanted, when we wanted, how we wanted, we'd kill ourselves. How many here remember a guy named Chris Farley? Movie star? How many here know how he died? He threw himself a birthday party, and with his money, he set up to have the best food he could buy, the best drugs he could buy, the best alcohol he could buy, and the best prostitutes that he could buy. And he had himself a party. At the end of 11 days, they carried him out in a stretcher. If you give everything to yourself that you yourself want, it will kill you. So sooner or later, you're going to have to say no to the things you want. Sooner or later, you're going to have to sacrifice something in order to stay alive and healthy. Particularly if you've got something wrong with you. How many here, you know, me included, eat things that are not healthy for you? Right. See? Well, we can get away with that on a limited basis, but sooner or later, that catches up with you. For a long time, I could work six or seven days a week, homeschool my kids, study the Bible on my own, volunteer at church, be a husband and a father, and still remain basically healthy. I can't do that anymore. Amen. November 5th of last year, I had a migraine event that just stopped me cold and put me in a hospital. And the Holy Spirit told me that you can't work six days a week anymore and do everything else you're doing. There's some things we just can't do. And so Paul here is saying, you've got to die to some things. He said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. Picture in your head right now a crucifixion. We all know what that is. You got nails in your hands, you got nails in your feet, you're on a wooden cross. And Paul says, that's how you present yourself a living sacrifice. Now, literally, he didn't want you to go have somebody else nail your hands and feet to a cross and let you bleed to death. He wants you to stay alive and sacrifice. So how do you do that? The illustration being, you don't let your hands handle the things that lead you to sin. If you're struggling with substance abuse, just don't handle that stuff. Don't put yourself in a position like that. If you're struggling with whatever, don't let your feet go there to places that you used to sin. Nail those feet. Don't let your hands touch the things you used to touch and play with. Do that for God. Do that because he rescued you. Do that because the Holy Spirit needs your body to do things. Paul's saying here, so five after five, I've got... Seven minutes. I didn't say anything. <laughs> All of it. Holy. You cannot hold anything back. This was made known to me in a very deep way when my wife and our friends wanted a large family, and I didn't. And God asked me that. Did you present your whole body to me? And are you willing to do my will? Yep. Yep. And instead of having three children, we have six. Your whole body has to be given to God. Because if it's not, whatever you hold back is the thing that's going to get attacked. It's the thing that's going to destroy you. It just is. This is what is acceptable unto God. Anything less than that is not. That's what he accepts. If you try to offer your body to him, but you hold back some things, that's not acceptable. He's not going to accept that. If you try to negotiate with him that I'll do this and this for this length of time, but after that, it's mine again. That's not acceptable. And it is a reasonable service. And I love this two-word <coughs> translation because where we got our word liturgy. In Greek, is lighter gale. It comes from laos, which is people, and ergo, which is work, where we get ergonomics. The work of the people. God is not going to accept your body and then not take you up on service. 
God is not going to heal you so you can sin comfortably. God's not going to prosper you so you can indulge yourself. He's going to want you to serve. Finish this sentence for me if you know it. He that is greatest among you must be the least of these. servant of all. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with your body. Serve. <coughs> and it's serving in things that you're doing, that you're good at. I love what Glennis does. She serves, are you ready for this? With balloons. That's so funny. That's her <laughs> service. I love what my wife does. I mean, we've got scones over there. That's how she serves. Others of you have opportunities to serve. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. This word, be not conformed, is a Greek word, schematico, where we get our word schematic. A schematic, of those of you that know this, is basically a blueprint. It, this, all the electricity in this sanctuary conforms to a schematic. The wires go to certain plugs, certain switches, from certain locations. Everything is just laid out for you. The world has laid everything out for you. The world system functions that if you can feed the lust of the flesh with the pleasure of sin for a season for the love of money, you will succeed in the world system. You will not succeed in God's. So you have a choice. You can either be conformed to the schematic of the world, and this word world is cosmos, which means a satanic order. Satan's got an order. I mean, we've got TV shows now about Satan. That's interesting. Amazing. And the occult. Because I've heard that word for the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Is it the same word with a C? or? I'm sorry? Modern translation. Uh, okay. The, it's, it's yeah, the, cosmos is all. It's the same the C word, but they spell the K instead of the C. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Australian, American. Yeah. Okay. At this, in this, in the Greek language, this was the hard K sound. And K was a hard K sound. Okay. They didn't have a ch or a s sound for C. Mm -hmm. They just didn't. Or you are transformed. This is where we get the word metamorphosis, because that's exactly what the word is. We just lifted it from Greek into English. It comes from meta, which means change, and morph, which means from the inside out. Morph it. It's not something just on the outside. How many here have ever gutted a room and rebuilt it? That's morphing. It doesn't really change the outside, but you change everything inside. Mm -hmm. That's what God wants to do with you. He's not going to change your outside. When you come to the day before you came to Christ, you looked a certain way. The day after you came to Christ, you probably looked the same way. Your outside didn't change. That's not what God's interested in mostly. This particular earth suit is not going to last very long. <coughs> Your spirit will last forever, and that's where he goes for his work. He will change you from the inside out, but he needs your help. It is not automatic. Growth is not automatic, even with people. What do you got to do to grow? Eat, Eat, Eat sleep, sleep, exercise, do stuff. Mm -hmm. You got to do the same thing spiritually. To be transformed, you have to renew your mind. How do you remove, renew your mind? Your mind is taught to think a certain way by this world system. God wants you to change that by renewing your mind in his word. These are the laws of the kingdom of God. And this is how we are to govern our lives. Yes, we will still interact with the world. Jesus interacted with the world. Christians have interacted with the world ever since there have been Christians. But that's not supposed to get inside of you. What's supposed to get inside of you is this book. And in particular, not just the words, but the ministry of the Holy Spirit, your body offered to him. And then he expects you to do something with that body, which means you put the word of God into you, inside of you. So it, he can have something to change you with. That's bad grammar, but it works. The Holy Spirit needs tools. Now, real quick, turn to, in your Bibles, to Proverbs chapter 2. We're almost done. 
And all God's people said, hooray. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm going to start reading verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to verse 9. Actually, we'll read verse 10, too. My son, again, a relationship. If you will receive my words and hide my commandments with you. How do we hide them in us? By speaking them from our mouth, hearing them with the ear. And there's just this little limerick you can learn for your own good. Into the eyes, into the ears, into the mouth, into the heart. That's how it works. So that you incline your ear unto wisdom and not the world system. You apply your heart to understanding. And the Bible says that the knowledge of the holy is understanding. If you cry after knowledge, you lift up your voice for understanding. There's your mouth again. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hid treasures. How many here think you could dig for silver with your bare hands? Follow a vein of silver in solid rock with your bare hands. You need tools. How many here think you could actually dig for buried treasure with your bare hands? Something covered with tree roots and rocks and stuff? No, you're not, you need tools to do that. And the tools I give you are on the front, page, front of that page. So that you understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He lays up sound wisdom for those that are right. He is a shield to them that walk uprightly. He will keep the paths of judgment and preserve the way of his saints so that you will understand righteousness, judgment, and equity, yea, every good path. Every good path that you could possibly want is found in that book, and you're going to have to dig for it. And the way you dig for it is you renew your mind. And that when you do that, you will prove. And that word prove, interestingly enough, was a... Bazaar term, B-A-Z-A-A-R. You've seen Middle Eastern bazaars. I mean, you at least have a picture of them maybe in your head. This guy, he's got a tapestry over him. He's got some sort of bazaar. Bazaar, okay. Like a market. Yeah, an Eastern, you're an East Middle Eastern market. Guy's got a tapestry over him. He's got some sort of desk. He's got his wares there. You walk up to that and say, so what do you do? What is this? Well, he'll show you what he does, what this does. He'll present his best to you. He's got things hidden in back he can bring to you. You know, if, if, if you ask him, that's what you do. And if you are able to do that with the things of God, you will prove to somebody that's asking you a question about what you believe. If you don't yield your body to the Holy Spirit, if you don't renew your mind in Scripture, when people come up to you and ask you things about God and just discuss about God and want to pick on you for your faith, yeah, you know, you just sort of, uh, you wouldn't be in that market very long. God wants us to interact with people and to present to them why we believe what we believe, how this works, how it worked for me, how it worked for you, how it changed you, how it brought you through a problem. That's what they want to hear. They want to know what works and what's real, not some philosophy. And this will enable you to produce these things. This is all one set. Good simply means the absence of everything that's bad. For example, I could place here a really nice, good tomato, and I could place here one that sat on the kitchen sill for three weeks. Which one's going to be good? That one? Because this one was neglected. This one, you didn't use it. You didn't do anything with it. And if you don't do anything with your faith, it literally will age and rot. You will not lose your salvation, but you'll feel it on the inside. You'll feel deflated. You'll feel stupid. You'll feel powerless. You'll feel angry and frustrated. At yourself. Don't do these things. That's what happens. That's why Paul is saying here, please do this. It has to be good. It is acceptable. Where did we see that word acceptable before? Little sacrifice, a little sacrifice. Yeah. That's what he accepts. And perfect, interestingly enough, does not mean without fault. Perfect is a mariner's term. It's a Greek word, teleos. And T-E-L-E-I 
O-S. And it literally means a ship outfitted for the journey. T-E-I. T-E-I. T-E-L, I'm sorry, I'll put that in. T-E-L-I-O-S, Telios. And it literally means a ship outfitted for the journey. If a ship was going to trade wheat from Egypt to Italy, then it was outfitted for wheat. If it was going to transport slaves, then it was outfitted for them. It was going to trans whatever it was transporting is what it was fitted for. Whatever calling God has for you, he'll fit you for. He'll give you the stuff that you need in order to do what he wants you to do. He doesn't send you out there unarmed, powerless. He sends you out there with everything you need and you'll survive the storms. And that's his will. That word will is the Greek word philema. T-H-E-L-E-M-A. And literally means what he delights in and chooses. It doesn't mean that his, he is an iron will dictator that will force upon you things that are uncomfortable, painful, and not help you to deal with it. He wants to work with you. His will means he will get in there with you. Amen. Be part of it with you. We don't do this alone. Is yes. there a group of people or scholars or something named Thelemix? Or how would you I would say that? Thelema? Are, is there a group of people that were, have been called Thelemix? No. Thelemix? Thelemist. They're Thelemist. Okay. Right. Um, God's will means that which he chooses, delights in, and prefers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, this is our foundation scripture. This is the beginning and the direction of this class. And I thank you for that. Now, in the first four pages of your packet, actually be two front and back, look up the references that are there, write them out by hand. And it would be best for you to get them in your eyes, in your ears, in your mouth, in your heart. Because that's where God works. Mm -hmm. Any questions at all? Is this going to absorb or which area you're talking about right now? Yes. These three are just partial. These are already copied out for you. Okay. So that all you have to do is copy them yourself. So the ones you want us to copy are all of these. Those. The other one is and yeah, that's it. And Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. Okay. The very last one on the absorb, I've got Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. Copy that one out as well. It's on there. It's on there. Okay. At the very last thing on absorb. Right there. Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. Those are the scriptures you are to copy out before we meet again. Should we copy them out in a place of their own? Should we put them in the same book? Or we're copying them out mostly to get them into our into our mind mm -hmm. right? and heart. Okay. That's how I, it I read starts. somewhere that if you write something out, it's it's like um, reading it seven times. Yeah. Well, there is what's called the fifty six chapter. Okay. You may have been ready to say this, but the way I was taught by him and in school is that you really want to get something in your head and memorized. You write it out seven times. And you speak um, it mm. seven times. There's something about the yeah, number seven. Yeah, it's called the 57 rule. You write it out five times and or speak go. it seven yeah, times. Yeah, like that. Mm. That's basically how you get it in there. And then your spirit will chew on that and actually nourish itself with that. And that's really what you want. All right, let's close the prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for giving us wisdom from our Creator on how to live the life that we have to live in order to be delivered from the power of darkness and to understand and live in the kingdom of your dear Son. You have redeemed us. We thank you and now we offer ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices for you to do your will in us and then through us. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, everyone says, Amen. Amen. Thank you.